What is real? How do you define real? If you're talking about what you can feel, what you can smell, taste, and see, then real is simply electrical signals interpreted by your brain. The senses are decoding systems, decoding information into a form that the brain can uh, decode. So the senses are taking waveform information, vibrational information, they're turning into electrical information, they are communicating it to the brain, which then decodes that into a sense of reality we call the world we live in. So the world that we think we're living in exists there. The brain is dark but sees light. How is that possible? How can my brain be totally dark and I see this light? Because that light in its prime form, like everything else, is just an information source. And I am decoding that information source in here into the visual reality of light because that's what the information contains. Thus, that's what it manifests when I decode it. This is mainstream science. They talk about dark energy, dark matter. I see that slightly differently, but the principle is the same, what you can see and what you can't see. So you have this massive area of stuff they say exists in this universe, which we can't see. You then have light, electromagnetic spectrum, etc., which is 5% of what they say exists in this universe, and visible light, which is the only frequency band that we can decode into a visual reality. This is the visible spectrum within the electromagnetic spectrum. Look at it, it's tiny, and that's all that we can see. So, this is right. There is no spoon. It's not the spoon that bends, it is only yourself. Because that spoon only exists in that form when you decode it from energetic information. Information is encoded in what we call light. White light contains all the colors of the spectrum. And colors are frequencies. They're just different frequencies. And when we decode them, we see that color. And we, we think those flowers are red and yellow. They're not. Nothing has any color. The color is decided in our perception of it. And the moment the brain puts all of its attention on the cause, it takes a snapshot, and that's called a memory. So long-term memories are created from very highly emotional experiences. So what happens then is that people think neurologically within the circuitry of that experience, and they feel chemically within the boundaries of those emotions. And so when you have an emotional reaction to someone or something, most people think that they can't control their emotional reaction. Well, it turns out if you allow that emotional reaction, it's called a refractory period, to last for hours or days, that's called a mood. You say to someone, hey, well, what's up? You say, I'm in a mood. Well, why are you in a mood? Well, I had this thing happen to me five days ago, and I'm having one long emotional reaction. If you keep that same emotional reaction going on for weeks or months, that's called temperament. Why is he so bitter? I don't know. Let's ask him. Why is he so bitter? Why are you bitter? Well. I had this thing happen to me nine months ago. And if you keep that same emotional reaction going on for years on end, that's called a personality trait. And so learning how to shorten your refractory period of emotional reactions is really where the, where the work starts. So then people, when they have an event, what they do is they keep recalling the event because the, the emotions of stress hormones, the survival emotions, are saying, pay attention to what happened because you want to be prepared if it happens again. Turns out most people spend 70% of their life living in survival and living in stress, so they're, they're always anticipating the worst case scenario based on a past experience. And they're literally, out of the infinite potentials in the quantum field, they're selecting the worst possible outcome and they're beginning to emotionally embrace it with fear. And they're conditioning their body into a state of fear. Do that enough times? body has a panic attack without you. you. You can't even predict it because it's programmed subconsciously. And what that means from a biological standpoint is that they haven't been able to change since that event. So then the emotions from the experience tend to give the body and the brain a rush of energy. So people become addicted to the rush of those emotions and they use the problems and conditions in their life to reaffirm their limitation so at least they can feel something. 
So now when it comes time to change, you say to the person, why are you this way? Well, every time they recall the event, they're producing the same chemistry in their brain and body as if the event is occurring. Firing and wiring the same circuits and sending the same emotional signature to the body. Well, what's the relevance behind that? Well, your body is the unconscious mind. It doesn't know the difference between the experience that's creating the emotion and the emotion that you're creating by thought alone. So the body's believing. It's living in the same past experience 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And so then when those emotions influence certain thoughts, and they do, and then those thoughts create the same emotions, and those same emotions influence the same thoughts, now the entire person's uh, state of being is in the past. So then the hardest part about change is not making the same choice as you did the day before, period. And the moment you decide to make a different choice, get ready because it's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel unfamiliar. It, there's going to be some why, uncertainty. Why does it feel so uncomfortable? Is it because of the, the, the neurons that fire together, wire together, so I've, there's like an easiness to that loop? Just because literally, and you've talked very eloquently about this, the way that the neurons connect in the brain, how rapidly, I've seen you show footage of how yeah. rapidly those connections happen, which is pretty incredible. Um, is, is that what makes it so discomforting for people? I think that, I think that the bigger thing is that we, we keep firing and wiring those circuits, they become more hardwired. So you have a thought and then the program runs. But it's the emotion that follows the thought. If you have a, if you have a fearful thought, you're going to feel anxiety. The moment you feel anxiety, your brain's checking in with your body and saying, yeah, you're pretty anxious. So then you start thinking more corresponding thoughts equal to how you feel. Well, the redundancy of that cycle conditions the body to become the mind. So now, when it comes time to change, a person steps into that river of change and they make a different choice and all of a sudden, they don't, they, they, they don't feel the same way. So the body says, well, you've been doing this for 35 years. Uh, I just stop feel, suffering and stop feeling guilty and stop feeling shameful and you're not going to complain or blame or make excuses or feel sorry for yourself. Well, <laughs> the body's in the unknown. So the body says, I want to return back to familiar ter territory. So the body starts influencing the mind and it says, start tomorrow. You're too much like your mother. You'll never change. This isn't going to work for you. This doesn't feel right. Uh, and so if you respond to that thought as if it's true, that same thought will lead to the same choice, which will lead to the same behavior, which will create the same experience, which will produce the same emotion. When you are moving away from yourself, as long as you're moving back towards your universal essence, your harmony with yourself, your cooperation with the rest, things will start happening in ways that you never dreamt of. And we, it's, it's a term that we use to, to explain how unexplainable coincidences sort of happen in our life and how come these things happen. I'm going to share a couple of those with you before we leave. The, the quality versus appearance in your life means that you get that inner candle flame working in a way that gives you quality, independent of what other people think of you. Maslow, in defining self-actualizing, no-limit people, said they are independent of the good opinion of other people. Of the good opinion of other people. Independent of it. They're so busy advancing confidently, doing the things that make sense, and bringing success to changing their baby's diaper and bringing success to weeding their garden and bringing it to the job. They bring it on the airplane so that when they run into somebody who is, who is rude to them, a stewardess that is rude, they don't see it as an attack on them. It's just where they are and they send them love. Help them a little bit, you know. They're kind. When somebody wants to get in on the freeway, it is, it's a new way of being. It's a way of quality where your harmony allows you to cooperate and you are a part of what this whole thing is about. New way of being, quality rather than appearances. Another new way of being, very important. Living your life on ethics rather than rules. All these rules, all these ways of having to do things, somebody else dictates to them. Do you know that some of the most immoral acts in the world have been perpetrated in the name of the rules? These are the laws. What do you think Nazi Germany was all about? Everybody doing all these horrible things to other people. I'm only doing my job was the defense we all heard at Nuremberg. I was just doing my job. If it's an immoral rule, it's immoral to obey it. 
And self-actualizing people, as Maslow tells us, have rules inside of them that they could never obey, never disobey, ever. And they have to do with ethics, how you treat people. How do you think we get to where we are now? You know who Rosa Parks was? The woman in the South, the black woman in the South who said, not today, I'm not going to the back today. No way. I know what the rules are. The rules were all over the place. If you didn't need, if you needed a reminder, there were signs every place, colored in the back, white in the front. And she said, no, I'm sitting here. And that made all the difference. Ethics, not rules. When your children start disobeying rules that need to be disobeyed, don't be surprised. Whatever you're up against, whatever you're going through, this is only a test. All of us this morning are either coming out of a test, headed towards a test, or we're being tested right now. But the good news is, it's only a test. The progress is in the process, and if you don't, if you don't do it, he can't bless it. You got to throw everything. The misnomer is you have grossly underestimated what it takes to succeed. Want to be a doctor? Work that thing. Time is short. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The saddest thing I have ever seen is a wasted opportunity. I've seen people misunderstand the opportunity, pollute it with arrogance or self-aggrandizement and lose the opportunity. You may not understand why it's taken so long, why it hasn't turned out the way you thought, why you're in a lonely season, but everything you've been through was to strengthen you to develop you, to prepare you. God wouldn't have allowed it if it wasn't part of the process. Without it, you couldn't give birth to what's in you. Keep passing the test. Keep doing the right thing, then your time is coming. Your baby is on the way. What God promised, he will bring to pass. Listen to me. You have been given an opportunity. You have been given an opportunity of a lifetime. And if you think you're going to blow up, if you think you're going to get to the next level by luck, you got another thing coming. You're not going to go through life and get everything you want all the time. And you need to learn to be happy anyway. You need to trust God. If that's what God wants you to get, then he'll get it to you. And if it's not coming to you right now, then just be a happy camper anyway. Opportunity comes in chaos. A chance to stand up. A chance to get it right. A chance to make a U-turn. It may not be for everybody. It is how you perceive the chaos, whether you determine it to be opposition or opportunity. The process, the little steps that make a mile, it is not the destination. It is the things you learn along the way. It is the people who beguiled you and tricked you that make you wiser. Wisdom is made out of the stupid things you did before you got it. Don't miss it. That process is invaluable to you getting there. Does that mean that you have to be my age before you get there? Absolutely not. But it does mean that you don't go from thinking a thought to producing an idea without pain. The gestation period is critical. Gestation creates formation. By not being prepared, you make the choice of getting caught in some of life's unpleasant circumstances. Failures, personal losses. By not being prepared, it's your choice. Now here's the other side of it. By being prepared, you increase your chances of success. Some people tend to blame others for their mistakes. Concentrate on the work at hand and demand of yourself the discipline to stay focused.
If you have a long list of things to get done within a day, do the toughest ones while your concentration is at its peak. Learn your body's rhythms and do the jobs that need the most concentration when you're able to do them best. Use your discipline to keep your mind in line. When you recognize the need to concentrate more, when you recognize this need, it will come easier and easier. Focused concentration can become a habit. Make your mind pay attention. Discipline yourself to be where you are. Work at work and play at play. Don't mix the two. I know people do things that hurt you. Everything is not fair and everything is not just and everything's not right. And sometimes you've done the very best and you don't get selected and you don't get the opportunity and you haven't gotten recognized. You cannot afford to get bitter because if you get bitter, you will never get better. You got to get that out of you. If you got to cough it up, if you got to throw it up, if you got to pray it up, you got to get it out of you. There's a curse on it. There's a curse. You got to get it out. 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 He left you. He cheated on you. But get it out. Get it out of you. Get it out of you. So you go ahead. When you look at over 33 million people have lost their job, this is unprecedented. There, this trauma that's going on all across the country, it affects all of us. There are things that we can do and things that we must do to pick ourselves up Success is not final, and failure is not fatal. We all have the challenge to search deep within ourselves to find our inner hunger, which is our power. That's the character test. It's like, what do you do with messages of error? And that's a tricky issue. Okay, so here's a solution to that. Here's what not to do. I am a bad person. I got to see myself. I'm a bad person. I might as well just go jump off the bridge. It's like, no, that's not good. Because what that means is that every time, every time you try to learn something, you're going to make a mistake. Because what do you know? So you're going to make mistakes. And if the rule is every time you make a mistake, you're going to go jump off the bridge, then that's not a useful problem solving strategy. And so when you make a mistake, you don't get to beat yourself to death with a club. It's a bad strategy, and you'll have your internal tyrant in there who's perfectly happy about doing that. That's the overactive superego that Freud talked about. Maybe it came to you via a parent who was too authoritarian, or a grandparent, or maybe it's just you because you're disagreeable and neurotic, or hyper-conscientious, you'll take yourself apart. Then the question is, well, what does that mean? Well, maybe you're not looking at the world right. Maybe your goals are wrong. Maybe you're not acting properly. If you take yourself and you put yourself in a new environment, new genes turn on in your nervous system. They encode for new proteins. You're full of biological potential that won't be realized unless you move yourself around in the world into different challenging circumstances, and that'll turn on different circuits. It's that by exposing yourself to different environments, you put different physiological demands on yourself all the way down to the genetic level, and that manifests new elements of you. Because you take yourself out of your dopey little village and that's just the little bounded you that everyone knows and that isn't very expanded. And then you go somewhere dark and dangerous and while you do that, you have adventures and they toughen you and pull more out of you, partly because you're becoming informed. Now, my approach to my better future very early on in my career was to just go through the day with my fingers crossed. I sure hope things will change for the better. Then here's what I found out. They're not going to change. When you change, when you get better, it'll get better. Don't put it on someone else. Hope that someone else will change it for you. Take responsibility for yourself. You can't change the circumstances or the seasons or the wind. You can change whether or not you go for the skills. Multiply your value by two, three, five, ten. That you've got charge of. That you have control of. You don't have control of the constellations. Learn some new skills. You have control over that. And if you don't, that's your fault. You've got to take personal responsibility. You've got to be self-reliant. Nobody else can change your life. Alter your ambitions. Pave a golden road for you. It's up to you. 
Be responsible for yourself. Learn to reap the harvest without complaint. Take full responsibility for everything you do. Be responsible to yourself. It's your crop. And so if your life isn't everything it could be, you could ask yourself, well, what would happen if you just stopped wasting the opportunities that are in front of you? You'd be, who knows how much more efficient, 10 times more efficient. If people stopped really, really trying just to make things worse, we have no idea how much better they would get just because of that. So there's this weird dynamic that's part of the existential system of ideas between human vulnerability, both of which are, are major causes of suffering, and the failure of individuals to adopt the responsibility that they know they should adopt. People have a conscience. It's this feeling or voice you have in your head just before you do something that you know is stupid, telling you that probably you shouldn't do that stupid thing. But you go ahead and do it anyways, and then, of course, exactly what the conscience told you was going to happen inevitably happens so that you feel even stupider about it than you would if it happened by accident. I knew this was going to happen, and I went and did it anyways. And the funny thing, too, is that that conscience operates within people, and we really don't understand what the hell that is. good list that I've put together, inspired by a couple of others and my own contribution, and I'd like to share this list with you. First, learning the power of purpose. A person who has purpose in their life, they have something to go for, some meaning. One writer described it, for some people it becomes a magnificent obsession. And for you and I, maybe it doesn't need to be that dramatic as a magnificent obsession. But it has to be something that does something to us, something that pulls us, especially into the future. You know, there are many influences on us. One is the influence of the past. Some people are always pulled back, back, back by the past. Some people are always pulled aside by the distractions, the distractions. But here's what's powerful. If you have a list of high purpose in your life, it pulls you toward the future. And the more powerful the purpose is, the stronger it pulls. And here's the other great advantage if you have purpose for the future. It pulls you through all kinds of challenges and all kinds of difficulties. If you don't have these strong purposes for the future, it's easy to get swallowed by a bad day. It's easy to be almost annihilated by a poor month. And it's easy sometimes to almost disappear beneath the waves of a, a year that goes backwards if you don't have something to pull you beyond that year. So if you want something to pull you through all kinds of challenges, all kinds of difficulties and things that come at you, you gotta have something on out there, beyond today, beyond next week, beyond next month, beyond this year that pulls you into the future. And the clearer it is, the stronger it pulls. The more, the more dynamic it is, the more it affects your life, your spirit, your heart, your soul. It also creates imagination. It gets your mind working on how to achieve that purpose. And if your mind will work, and if your heart works, and if your spirit works, and if you have good input, like good ideas, I'm telling you, there isn't anything you can't accomplish. Well, that's one of the great powers that'll make a variable of you, and that is purpose. Here's the next one, self-confidence. Where does self-confidence come from? And this is the best advice I can give you on that. Not neglecting, first of all, the small daily disciplines. Self-confidence really comes from feeling good about yourself. And one of the best ways to feel good about yourself is at the end of the day to know that you poured it on. You did your best. 
If you conducted a meeting, you did the best you could. If you made a phone call, it was the best phone call you could possibly make. If you wrote a letter, it wasn't a casual letter, it was your best letter. At the end of those kind of days, when you feel good about yourself, self-confidence starts to rise. You know that if you can have this kind of a good day, you can have another one the next day, and those days become the weeks, the weeks become the months, and the month becomes a powerful year. Self-confidence comes from the lack of neglect. If you will not neglect to do the small daily disciplines, that's where self-confidence comes from. Part of good health is self-confidence. I know I'm going to be healthy. I eat the apple a day. I walk around the block. I do the jogging on the beach. At the end of the day, when you've really poured it on and you've done all the stuff, self-confidence grows. That self-confidence affects your health, it affects your future, it affects your psyche. So this is true. One of the great powers is self-confidence. Self-confidence means willingness to do whatever it takes to achieve. Some people say, well, I'll do it for a little while and see what happens. You know, I'll try a couple of things. If that doesn't work, I'm out of here. And all of us know that that kind of person doesn't have much of a future. But if you're willing to do whatever it takes, if I have to learn a couple of things, I will learn those things. If I got to learn five or six things, I'll learn all six. If I have to take an extra class, I'll take an extra class. If I've got to read the books, I'll read the books. If I have to consult with people who know more than I know, I will do the necessary consulting. Whatever it takes, I will do. That starts to develop unbelievable self-confidence. Self-confidence also comes from the ability to rise above your circumstances, to rise above what happens, the petty little things, the discouraging things that would sink everyone else's ship except yours, that would cause someone else to quit early in the day, but you keep going. That kind of willingness to overcome all circumstances, whether it's the little challenges or the big challenges, if you're willing to do that, I promise you, this kind of power will work for you. And in you, the variable, it'll make a difference. The third on the list I had was enthusiasm. And here's what I wrote about enthusiasm. Enthusiasm that's powerful is mostly enthusiasm that is enthusiasm inside. 90%, 10% outside. We all know what the enthusiasm is like when somebody lets us see their enthusiasm, which is the, like the 90% and only 10% of it is inside. But the enthusiasm that really affects people is not just being loud, but the enthusiasm that runs deep, the enthusiasm that comes from deep inside created by self-confidence, created by purpose, created by genuine willingness to help other people. That kind of enthusiasm, knowing that you're gonna get the job done, knowing you're gonna affect people, knowing you're gonna have testimonials flowing in from all kinds of uh, directions, that kind of enthusiasm. A lot of it is quiet, a lot of it is unheard, and the 10% that's heard, it rings a bell. People call it genuine enthusiasm because they know that what you say in the outward display of your enthusiasm is only a small tip of the iceberg of the enthusiasm you feel inside that really motivates you to do the best job you can. Why is it that most people don't pursue their dreams or don't do better than what they're doing if they're capable of doing it? I think that many of us don't go the next step because we don't know what to do yet. And I say that, that the reason that we don't even explore the possibility of what to do is because subconsciously we don't believe that it can happen for us and we don't believe that we deserve it. How much time do you spend working on you? How much time do you spend every day working on your dream? In the last 90 days, how many books have you read? In the last year, what new skill or knowledge have you acquired? What kind of investment have you made in you? So I'm saying that as you begin to look at where you want to go, if you want to make it today, 
and things are changing so fast you have to literally run to stand still. I'm saying that you've got to make some conscious effort to begin to work to develop you. Here's something else. Most people are not living their dreams because of fear, ladies and gentlemen. I was in Columbus, Ohio yesterday speaking for a particular Ohio department. Young lady named Karen who greeted me, who organized the event. Very talented, very skillful. And she was talking about she wanted to become involved in the consulting business. I said, why aren't you doing it? I said, you have the abilities. I said, you're not here because they like you. You're here because you're doing the job. You're making things happen. And she came up with all kinds of ideas, but finally she said, I guess I, I can't see myself doing it. I guess I'm afraid. Fear, limited vision, and lack of self-esteem is what keep most people doing things they don't want to do. I was, flew from Columbus, Ohio to Denver, Colorado to a major communications company. And the person that picked me up at the airport told me about the fact that the company was planning on having a major downsizing. And they offered some of the employees there an early retirement and some of them will earn as much as $300,000. And they said, this is the last time that you can take this offer. If you don't do it, when we have the downsizing, you might be among those who will lose their jobs and all you will get is your severance pay. And only 50% of the people who were eligible to take the $300,000 took it. The others were afraid to take a chance on themselves. The others couldn't see themselves beyond that company. They couldn't see life after that company. The same reason that people stay in relationships where they're abused or they're unhappy or it's unfulfilling. They can't see themselves beyond that relationship. They can't see themselves enjoying life without that person. They think that this is all that they can do. The same reason that people get stuck at a certain level in life. They can't see things being better for them. And they think that this is it and this is all they deserve. This is all they've ever seen. It's been passed on to them. And they think that this is it for them. Oh no, I was looking what Dr. Blanton, Smiley Blanton, who is a colleague of Dr. Norman Vincent Peale, what he said about fear. He said, fear is the most subtle and destructive of all human diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, fear kills dreams. Fear kills hope. Fear, put people in the hospital. Fear can age you. Fear, ladies and gentlemen, can hold you back from doing something that you know within yourself that you're capable of doing, but it will paralyze you. And it seemed like you're in a hypnotic spell. And I ask you a question, what is the benefit? What's the benefit of allowing fear to hold you back? What's the benefit of giving up on yourself, of not stepping out on life and taking life on? What is the benefit for you? What's the plus in that? It's one of the things I had to ask myself. So I didn't want to make any mistakes. I wanted everybody to like me. I wanted to be perfect the first time I did something. It's not going to happen. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to hurt some folks' feelings. You're going to create some enemies whenever you decide that you want to begin to take life on. You've got to ask yourself, how long am I going to allow this to hold me back? I like what Zig Ziglar says. He said, fear is false evidence appearing real. That is an illusion that we create in our mind. It is a state of mind that can be changed. So let's look at how we can begin to take some steps to restructure that fear, to begin to expand our visions of ourselves, to begin to increase our self-esteem. Webster said that self-esteem means confidence and satisfaction in oneself. Look at your life right now. Whatever you've done up to this point in time, your life is working. Whatever you have produced, it came out of you as a result of the kind of person that you have become. It's a result of your choices. It's a result of your consciousness. Now you have to ask yourself, 
Are you satisfied with what you have produced? Is this what you want? Would you like for things to be better than this? Do you believe that you deserve better than this? Or are you content? This is it. You don't have to do every, anything else. That you've already resigned yourself in life and said, well, I'm happy. I'm not starving like the people in Calcutta. Are you allowing yourself to get off the hook like that? Or do you believe somewhere in the back of your mind or in your heart that there's some other great work for you to do? There's something else that life has for you. And that's why you're here. How do we handle this fear factor? How do we increase our self-esteem? You have to begin to fortify yourself. How do we do that? I believe that you have to begin to consciously monitor your inner conversation and start talking to yourself. Start building yourself up. Sometimes the only good things you will hear about you are the things that you say to you. Young lady that, that was in the audience this afternoon said to me, I told myself yesterday for the first time, I'm proud of me. And she said, I felt good about that. So I'm saying, learn to be your own booster. Start building yourself up. Start encouraging yourself. Start saying, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I started thinking about becoming a speaker, I said, yes, I can do this. I can make this happen. When I start trying to convince myself I can be a businessman after flopping and failing and losing thousands of dollars and feeling stupid and dumb and having people take advantage of me because of what I didn't know. I had to talk to myself because people were saying to me that I was dumb. And somewhere in the back of my mind, I was saying, you're right, look at what I've done. I had to say, no, 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 Les. Hey, hey, come on, man, get yourself together. You can handle this, you just haven't figured it out yet. It's all right, this is your training period. This is the tuition you have to pay for what you don't know. You can do this, other people have done it. It doesn't take an Einstein. Get you some people that can teach you some stuff that you don't know. Get you some people that have done it successfully and learn from them. Take some seminars, workshops, read some books on how to manage a business. Change the way you see yourself and begin to tend to the personal details. Understand that nobody's going to take care of your business better than you. And when I start changing that kind of mindset of beating myself up because of my mistakes and start looking at the possibility of my doing better, of my making the adjustment that would enable me to do what I want to do successfully, things begin to change. And I say, stop beating up on yourself. You do do it. I know you do it. I've done it. It's a natural inclination for us to put ourselves down. See, we are born negative, I think, in a negative consciousness because we live in a negative world. See, you don't have to teach children to lie. They'll lie automatically. Did you wet in your pants? No, I did not. Well, what is that? I don't know. You don't have to encourage kids to misbehave. They will do it by themselves. You don't have to encourage them to do the wrong thing. They would do it automatically. You have to correct their behavior. So I'm saying that we have to work through the challenges of life in learning how to begin to work to fortify ourselves. Begin to guard your mind against negative programming, like turn off the television. Don't watch the news. Don't watch it. I think that, that, that more people have a sense of hopelessness and anxiety about life. If you look at the news, you cannot feel good looking at the news. You'll be scared to death. You're scared to go to sleep. I mean, it turns your power down. You've got to be conscious of that. Don't pick up the newspaper and read it. No, no. I, just try this. Just experiment with yourself. Now, if your job depends upon you knowing certain things, let somebody tell you just about those things. But start filtering the stuff you allow to come in your mind. You know that song you used to have? I said, don't let nobody bring you no bad news. I tell my staff, look here, don't tell me any bad news while I'm on the road. Let me handle it tomorrow. I don't like anybody to tell me any bad news at night before I go to sleep. I can't do anything about it anyhow. Why let me go to sleep with that on my consciousness? No. No, and my, my staff, they know that. Say, so let it wait till tomorrow. And I have a period of time. Tell me bad news between 10 o'clock and 12 noon. After I prayed and meditated and read my books, I'm fortified, I'm ready to handle it. I deal with them and I'm out of there and I'm going on to something else. 
So you've got to guard the kinds of things that you put in your mind. See, if you don't program your mind, your mind will be programmed because human beings are goal oriented. That's why we die of broken hearts early. That's why we're running through life to early graves. We're going through life, ladies and gentlemen. And I think that Henry David Thoreau said that most men live in quiet desperation. Most of us go through life running scared. Larry D'Angie, who I think is going to be one of the greatest motivational speakers around today, told me a story, a true story of a friend of his that every day when he came home from school, when he would get to a, a certain block in his neighborhood, there was a neighborhood dog that would chase him. And that dog would start after him barking, boy, he would run, just running from that dog every day, every day. Finally, he just got tired of that dog chasing him every day. He said, this dog come around here today, I'm gonna take a brick of stuff and bust him in the head. So he was walking home that day, minding his own business. Sure enough, same area, there was that dog there. And the dog started barking, he started running, he saw a brick and he stopped and picked up the brick and turned around and the dog got close to him, he realized the dog didn't have any teeth. He said, he put the brick down, he said, get on out of my way. And ladies and gentlemen, all our lives, many of us go through life running from things that ain't got no teeth to do us any harm. Haven't you been afraid to do something and then after you did it, you say, whoa, if i known it was this easy, I would have done it before. Haven't you ever had that experience? Raise your hand. Absolutely. So we created this in our minds, false evidence appearing real. We made it real in our minds. That's why Churchill said there's nothing to fear, but fear itself. That's the destructive monster. So turn off things that can contribute to your fear. Turn a deaf ear to people that all they can do is talk about how negative things are because they have bought into the consciousness of the world. Start attending workshops, seminars, listening to tapes on a daily basis to begin to recondition your mind, to retrain your thinking. Faith comes by what? Hearing and hearing and hearing. Listen to things that can empower you, that can enable you to create a new reality for yourself in a new life for yourself. You might appear to be strange around most people. You know, most people think you're strange if you're happy today. People say, how you doing? I said, better than good. Whoa, what's wrong with him? Just go around smiling and watch people. Look at this, is this a weird guy over here? Because most people don't smile. Watch him, look at their faces in the morning. Here we go, another Monday morning. How you doing? Haven't had my coffee yet, don't ask me. See, these people have not found their purpose in life. That's why they're grumpy, that's why they're miserable. That's why they're so negative. They're hurting and they wanna hurt other people. So start practicing using programs for your mind. Seminars, books, workshops. Keep a journal. Record your thoughts, what's happening with you. Every day when you get up, have a journal near you. I use a Jack Bolin journal so that I can write down my ideas. I keep it by my bed so I can write down my thoughts. See, ladies and gentlemen, we get three to four thoughts a year that if we would act on those thoughts, they could change our life. Don't say, well, I'll, I'll remember that. No, write that thought down. I got a thought today, I wrote down. A friend of mine is in the hospital. His morale is low. They're talking about amputating his foot. He's got to feel very bad. So I said, you know, I'm going to, I'm not only am I going to see him, but I can't be there with him all the time. I said, I'm going to create a tape for him that, that he can listen to that will heighten his level of morale. We told him the other night, don't go to surgery. You are depressed. Your energy level is down. No, no, tell him not now. Don't do it now. In fact, most doctors who have any sense of awareness don't perform surgery on patients that are in a state of fear, that don't think they will make it. They wait till they're in a different state of mind. So I said, what about making tapes for people that are facing physical challenges? I said, that's a good idea. Credit goes to our awesome patrons who make videos like this one possible. Consider joining them to support our work. You can also support us by subscribing to our channel and clicking the bell button to get notified when our new videos are released. And as always, thank you for watching.